there's only one object that we need to add before we can start coding in some actions for our player, and that's to add a light. So we go to create, and we have four different types of light. For now, we're just going to do a directional light. And right away, you can see that there's light being displayed. And a directional light kind of acts like the sun, if you will, and has no specific source. So even though these rays are coming down and shows the direction of the light, it's not actually from a single source. It's universal throughout the entire game world. Right now, you see there's no shadows, so the light's reflecting off the ball, but it's not casting any shadows. That's because our shadow type is no shadows. So we can come over here and cast hard shadows or soft shadows. Depending on the different style of the game, you can pick whichever type you want. I'm going to go with soft shadows. Now you can see that we have shadows along the wall in the player object. And you can change the direction of the light just like you would any other game object by just changing the rotation. So maybe if you want to make it look like it's getting nighttime, you can make the rays of the light get close to horizontal. If you want it to be around noon and very bright and you just want to make it so the rays are vertical and I'm going to be somewhere in between and we're going to call this the main light so I'll rename it notice my naming convention I'm always taking the objects and using capital letters and then if it's any more than one word there's no spaces and I make the next word capitalized so I went ahead and changed my camera to all one word What's unique about this game, and just a personal preference really, if you look at your player sphere, when the ball's rolling around, it's kind of hard to see the bottom here, and it's blended in with the shadow, the player to see the entire sphere. So what I can do is add another directional light. First, it makes it a little brighter because it's pretty much the same direction. But what I'm going to do is decrease the intensity so there's not as much light coming in. Point, let's try point 0.3. I want it to be exactly point 0.3. And I'm going to change it so the light source is shining up instead of down. So I'm going to rotate this around and basically from the total opposite direction. And let's tilt it this way a little bit. So the purpose of this is so now when you're looking at the object, okay, you can definitely see the bottom of the, the sphere as well. Point 0.3 seems to be a little heavy there. It's very noticeable. So let's try point 0.1. Ah, it's a little bit better. Okay, so now when I rotate around, you can definitely see all the edges of the sphere at the same time. Very nice contrast. If we test our game and we hit the play button, you'll notice where my objects are, we don't have a nice view of our layout. It's kind of flat here. So what we'll need to do is adjust where the camera is located. So I'm going to stop playtesting, choose my camera here, and notice you get a little camera preview down on the bottom. So you can either use this to adjust your camera position, or you can use the game view. All right, some people might have two different layouts. For example, you might have the scene view and then the game view in a different window. But for me, since this is a pretty primitive move, I'm just going to use the game camera preview. So I'm not going to be too picky right now. I'm going to move the camera back a little bit, move it up, and then I also want to rotate it down. So I need to select my rotation tool and change it so it's facing down on the game area. And we'll move it out. I want to be able to see the whole thing, so about right there. Okay, I'm just going to play test it so I can see it in a little bit big view. Not too bad. Okay, made some changes, so I'm going to go ahead and save my scene. All right, and I think we're ready for coding. So let's go ahead and put some motion on this player sphere. So we always want to add scripts in our folder that we created before. You should have a scripts folder. So we can right click on the scripts folder. We're going to create, and we've created a few things already. We've created a folder, created materials, but now we're going to create scripts. So we have three different types. We have JavaScript, C Sharp, and Boo. These are three different programming languages that are used for Unity. We're not going to use Boo at all, so you can look that up on your own if you want to see what's involved there. The majority of our scripts are going to be C Sharp, 
and we might deal with a few JavaScript scripts. Let's choose C Sharp. We're going to start there. So click that. It'll create a new script, which is C Sharp. Should be shown on a little paper here that's telling you that you created a C Sharp script. And we'll go ahead and name it Player Controller. All one word. Notice Player is capitalized, and Controller is also capitalized. I'll just click off of it. Notice this little load icon down in the bottom right hand corner. Once that is complete, that means the script has compiled and there are no errors displayed in our console, so we're good to go. All right, we do need a script in that file, so you can either right click and open, or you can just double click it. Just give the program a minute or two, it should open up Mono Develop, which is just a text editor that's included in Unity. And what we're looking at now is very similar to what was in Visual Basic. We have some opening statements. We have our public class. So this is where the script starts. And then at the end, we don't have any end function or end class statements. We just have a closing bracket. All right, so I'll make this a little bigger so it's easier to see for you guys. So right here, we're using the Unity game engine and all the properties and classes that are associated with it. So we have this using statement. So that means we can use all of the classes inside of the Unity engine. And then we also have this using system.collections. Remember the way that we pick out objects? So this is picking out the system that goes along with Unity engine, and then it's picking out a bunch of classes that are in what's called collections. We'll get to that later. But most of all, all of our scripts are going to have these two statements at the beginning. So they automatically do that because they're so common. So this is where our script starts. Notice it has our name in here. That's what we call the script. If you called it something else, that's the name that would display there. And then we have this colon, and then we have mono behavior. Mono behavior is a class that contains all of the different methods and properties that we're going to use on all of our objects. 90% of the scripts that we're going to create are going to have this mono behavior here because it's actually taking properties and classes from mono behavior and using them in our script. Okay, so that needs to stay there. So then we have an opening bracket. Now, when I go through and code with you guys, the format that I use is just a personal preference. There's many different ways of syntax that you can use to lay things out. So what I like to do is start out with the opening bracket on the next line and then the closing bracket on the same tab. We're still going to use nesting and indenting correctly so it's easy to read. Unlike Visual Basic, where it uses sub for a subroutine and function for a function, C Sharp uses void to represent a method. Okay, so we have a void, which is a method, is called start. And it has the set of parentheses afterwards, so we know this is an event. So if we were to put some code in here, just as the comment says right here, anything that we put in here would be ran at the start of our game. Anytime that you need to make a comment, just like we did in Visual Basic, we had an apostrophe and then you typed in some code. In C Sharp, if you want to do one line of comments, you use two slashes and then type in your comment. Or if you need to comment out entire blocks of code, you can use a slash and an asterisk. And then you need a closing asterisk slash. Okay, so notice this code right here is commented out and it's no longer going to be run. You can always tell that it's commented because it's gray and italic, whereas something that's actually going to be run is not. All right, so we actually don't need this start method. And we're looking at update. This update method is very similar to the timer tick that we used in Visual Basic. The code that's inside of this method is going to be run or called every frame. Okay, so whether your game runs at 60 frames per second, 30 frames, frames per second, whatever the frame rate is, this is how many times per second the code is going to be called. We actually don't want this at all because we're going to be attaching some components that need to be used in what's called fixed update. Fixed update is where all the physics and rigid body type of movements are going to be calculated. Fixed update is always ran after the update. All right, so I'm going to take this comment out and replace it with what this method is actually going to do. Called after update, okay, and then runs all physics calculations. 
All right. So like I said, there's different syntaxes, but I'm just going to use my personal preference. Again, when you watch other tutorials or watch other programmers code, they might have a different way of doing it. But as long as all the code is in the right order, it's going to do the same thing. Anytime you need to save a script, you can go up to File and Save. And again, your shortcut is Control S. It is always important when you're coding something, you want to save it before you go back to Unity and then test it out. So here, I'm going to hit Control S. It'll save it. There's no more asterisk at the top. When I click on Unity, again, we get the icon down in the bottom right hand corner. It'll compile. There's no more, no errors being displayed here, so it looks like we're okay. So what we're going to do is start to get the sphere to move. We have this fixed update, and we're going to create some type of movement for our sphere. There are different types of variables that we're allowed to use. Just like in Visual Basic, we have Boolean, which in C Sharp is called Boolean. We have integers, which we use int, very similar to what we did in Visual Basic. And then instead of decimal, in C Sharp, it's called a float. Okay, a floating decimal just means that it has many different decimal places. So what we're going to want to do is create a float to represent a horizontal movement. And we'll call it move horizontal. And what we can do, instead of setting up a variable and then setting a value to it, we're going to do it all in the same statement. So this is creating a variable inside of this method. And we're going to set it equal to some type of input. And now, since we put our dot, this input is a class. This is inherited by monode behavior. So if you need to figure out what methods or classes you can use from input, what's super nice about this program is that we can hit control apostrophe. So you hit the control key on the keyboard and then the apostrophe, and it'll open up a web page that gives you a huge description of what the input class does. I'll go ahead and bring over the window that it brought up for me. As you can see, it gives you a little description about what the input class does. Talks a little bit about mobile devices, but the main information is down here. These are all the different variables that we're able to access with this class, and then we have all the functions that we're able to access with this class. What we're actually going to use, as you can see, it has a list of names in the descriptions. We're looking for the one that's going to be able to get some input from a keyboard and get some direction. So right here, it returns the value of the virtual axis identified by the name. So if you click on that, it'll give you some more information and it'll show you how to use it. Okay, so clicking on this, it tells you exactly what it does. Gives you a little snippet of what the code will look like. And it is important that you're looking at the code in the right language. Right now it says C Sharp at the top, scripting reference. Make sure it is C Sharp. Notice it has the three different choices for Unity. Again, if you were in JavaScript, it would give you what the code would look like in JavaScript. Since we're doing a C Sharp script, we don't want to be there. And the example that they give you here is pretty much exactly what we're going to do. We're setting up a variable for, instead of our translation and rotation, it's just our position. And we're going to grab what the input is for the player and the player sphere. So this is how we're going to use our code. We'll go back to our code. We have input.getAxis. And so if we're going to move horizontal, which is left and right, we want to get the horizontal axis. All right. Notice the syntax. It's inside parentheses and inside quotation marks. Unlike Visual Basic, we do need to end every line of code with a semicolon, where in Visual Basic we did not have to. So semicolon ends that line of code, which tells the program that it needs to run the next line of code. So we're going to do pretty much the exact same thing, only now we need to move in the vertical direction. So this is going to be forward and backward. So get input dot get access. So what this is doing is creating a variable, a decimal variable, and then grabbing the value of our horizontal axis. So what this means is when the player presses the up, down, left, or right arrow keys, when you press those keys, you get a value anywhere from negative 1 to a positive 1. Right, and it's a decimal value. So with a keyboard, really you're only getting three values. If you don't press the key at all, you have zero. 
If you press it down to the right or forward, you get a 1. If you press the left arrow key or backward, you get a negative 1 because it's going in the opposite direction. Whereas if you were using a controller, such as an Xbox or a PlayStation controller, and you were moving the joysticks, you would get a decimal. If you weren't pressing the joystick all the way, maybe halfway you'd get 0.5 or negative 0.5. These commands are able to be used with different input devices, but for now we're just going to be using the keyboard. Okay, so we're getting the information from the keyboard, but we're not actually doing anything with it. We're not assigning it to the player object. So what we need to do is create some type of what's called a vector to force some type of movement onto the player sphere. So what we're going to do is create what's called a vector 3, because there has three directions. It has left and right, forward and back, and up and down. This is a very standard class that we're using, and it is a type of variable. So we're going to create a variable called movement. And we have a new keyword because we want a new direction for our player sphere. And as I hit the parentheses, notice that we get these little helper boxes here. This is called IntelliSense, just like we had in Visual Basic. What's awesome about this is that I Vector th what it's looking for are three different values. It's looking for its left and right value, and then up and down, forward and back. All right, so for example, an X, a Y, and a Z. All right, as I start, start typing here, and punch this in, let me try it again. So we get our IntelliSense moving here. So we can either type it in as an X and a Y, or we can type it in as an X, a Y, and a Z. And notice they are float values, so we're looking for decimal values. Well, our x value is left and right, and we want to use the variable that we created earlier. Next is going to be the y direction, as shown here. Well, when we move our sphere, or the player moves the sphere, we don't want it to go up or down. So we want it to be exactly 0. So we're going to type in 0, but then we also need an f to represent a float. If we just typed in a 0, that's going to be an int or an integer. Vectors always need float values. And for our z value, that's our forward and backward. So we'll do move vertical. Okay, zoom out so you can see the entire statement there. So this is what we have typed in to actually create a movement for our player. If you save this and try and play test, you still won't get that movement in there because this isn't actually being applied to our player yet. So a couple things we need to do before this works. First of all, save it. Go back into Unity. The wheel will kind of calculate here. And if we look, it's giving us a little warning. All right. The variable movement is assigned, but its value is never used. So in our script, we're creating this variable, but we're not using it in another statement. So again, this isn't a error. It's just a warning because it's yellow. We can still play test right now if we wanted to. If we hit the arrow keys, nothing's really happening because we haven't coded in any physics with the player yet. Next thing we need to do is add a physics component to our player. So if you click on the player sphere, it has a collider, meaning that it won't be able to go through other solid objects, but we need to put on what's called a rigid body. So we want to add that component either here or up in the component menu at the top. Again, I like this button here. It's nice and convenient. I'm going to go to component physics, and rigid body right at the top. What a rigid body does is allows us to put on a mass drag, angular drag if you will, and gravity. Okay, so this allows physics to interact with the object. I'm going to leave all the properties the same, but now we're actually going to reference this rigid body in code. All right, I did change the scene. So I'm going to go File, Save Scene. Once we add that rigid body onto the player, we now need to make sure that the script is going to act on the player. So we have the script in our scripts folder, but the script is not actually applied to any of our objects yet. So we need to apply this player controller script to the player. A couple different ways we can do that. The easiest way is to just make sure your player is selected. We can see all the players 
properties in the inspector here. Take your player controller script and just drag it over near the component button. When you do that, the script is now displayed in the inspector. The other way to do it is to make sure you have your player selected. If you aren't very good with drag and drop, you can go up to component. All the scripts that you create are under a new tab called scripts. And then just find the one that you labeled. And we only have one, it's player controller. If you click on that, it'll add it here. Now I've already dragged it and dropped it in there. So now we have two scripts on the player. Make sure you only have one. So I'm gonna click the gear menu here. I'm just gonna click remove component. All right, so you should only have one player controller script. So let's go ahead and code in and use this rigid body in code. So our next line is going to be grabbing that component from the sphere, rigid body, dot, and now we need to add in some type of event. So notice our IntelliSense here. These are all the different methods that we're allowed to use for a rigid body. The one that we want is very close to the top, add force. So we want to add a force on this player object. Well, we now need a direction. If you hit up and down on the arrow keys, you can scroll down this menu. These are the different ways to type in what type of force you want to create. Right now, we're just going to use a vector 3. Right? So that's why we created this vector 3 up here. This is the direction of our movement we want to put in. So we're just going to use the variable that we created here. So we're going to place in movement, and I'll end the statement there so there's no errors. However, we do want to edit this a little bit. All right. right now, we don't have a way to change the speed of the player, so we need to create that variable in code. Just like in Visual Basic, we need to create the variables at the beginning of the script, right after we name the script class. The way that we create a variable is very similar to Visual Basic, only we don't use the keyword dim. We're not going to use that anymore. We either have private variables or we have public variables. The biggest difference between public and private, just like as we described in class, a public variable will allow you to not only use the variable in this script and other scripts, but you will also be able to edit that value in the inspector. And that's super cool. If you create a private variable, it not only saves processing power, but you then won't be able to see it in the inspector. Okay, we'll be using a variety of different public and private variables, but for now, since we do want to change it in the inspector, let's keep it public. So we're going to create a public decimal value, and we're going to call it player speed, because we need to be able to edit the player's speed for now and test it and see which speed we'd like. So we're going to go ahead and multiply our movement vector by some type of speed. And then we're also going to multiply it by time dot delta time. Notice that it's in here for me. If I want to enter it in and prevent any type of spelling errors, once you start typing it in, just hit tab, and it'll automatically enter in the value for you. Notice the color coding throughout the script. The blue is a type of class or variable. Anything in green is a keyword. So we have public and new are different keywords. And then here we have a decimal, and then in black is either your variable names or different properties of classes. So for example, we have the time, which is the time since the game was first run. Delta means change in. So it's the change from the last frame. So anytime you include movement, in your game, you're going to want to include this line and then multiply it by your variables or any other type of movement to create. So let's go ahead and save this script. Right, again, check for errors. For example, just so you guys can see it, I'm going to leave off this last parenthesis. Okay, you guys don't have to do this, but I at least want you to see it. If I save this script and then go back into Unity, Right, once it compiles, notice I get this little red error message. Now this is an error. If it was yellow, it would be a warning. I'd still be able to play test, but it wouldn't be efficient. 
So this is saying unexpected symbol, got a semicolon, but it was expecting either an end parenthesis or a comma. So we need to put in one of those two back in our script. So if I was rereading this, notice it gives you the line and then the character in the line. So it's line 16, so I can look at the numbers on the left hand side. Here's line 16, character 69, which is right here. So it got a semicolon, but it was expecting either end parenthesis or a comma. So going back and just re-looking at my code, I see, oh, well that was dumb. I left out my end parenthesis. So if I resave it, go back into Unity, it'll take a minute. It'll recompile all the scripts. The error is gone. And then you also notice that the variable we created is right here in the editor. Right now our speed is zero. Hmm, we don't want our player speed to be zero. We should probably change that. We'll make it a thousand. We did have make some changes here, so Unity needs to be saved as well. So I'll go ahead and save the scene. And let's play test. Hit play. Looks like our player is there. When I use the right, left, up and down arrow keys, we got some movement. And it seems like it's super fast. Our acceleration is slow, but then the ball can move very fast. So you can edit the speed to whatever your liking is. I'll decrease it by half. Let's go to 500, see what that looks like. So I just slap play testing, change, and then go back into play testing. Yeah, that's a little bit better. Looks pretty good. If I were to change a value in here, for example, I can change it during playtesting. Say I change it down to maybe 250. Let's see what that seems like. And I move around. Okay. Once you change something in the inspector, if I use my right arrow keys, notice the player's not moving. I need to click back into the game view and keep that active as I play. So now when I move the sphere, it did change. Say I really like that and I want to keep it. When I end my playtesting, notice it went back to 500. When you're playtesting, none of the changes are saved. All right, so that ends our tutorial on player movement. If this scripting was overwhelming at first, don't get too stressed out about it because we're going to do lots and lots of different scripts together so you see different ways of scripting things and the more you use it and the more you practice, you're going to get used to setting up different movement patterns and ways of setting things up. So don't worry too much. Just try and work through the logic and think about what actions are happening in the game and what the different code means for the different actions. Feel free to type in comments as I'm talking so you can see what each line of code is doing. This is an example of what your script could look like with all the comments typed out. If you had trouble typing in or figuring out what each of the commands does, I went ahead and for at least the first script, typed out all the different comments re-explaining what each command does. Make sure your script is saved. Go back to Unity. It'll recompile and you should have no errors. If there are errors, just reread what the error is, see if you can fix it. If you double click on the error, it should open it back up to Unity and put the cursor right where the error would be.